This is the Run and Tell podcast. Each one united, come on. Each one united, come on, come on. Each one united, come on, don't fight it. You heard it here first, now run and tell of the righteous riot. Um, we moved from Lake Elsinore. Uh, we're in Bel- uh, Paramount. I'm sorry, Bakersfield for two years, uh-huh. Huntington Beach for one year, and now Paramount for three or four. Um, we've still maintained that jail ministry in Riverside with Robert. So mm-hmm. every third Friday, I would drive down there before a COVID hit, and we would get together and go in and uh, share the word. Mm. So those all those uh cities that you mentioned that mm. you moved your family yeah. you know a, a lot of times families kind of move in progression like yeah. maybe from uh east to west or vice versa right. but that seems pretty you know all over the map is is there a reason why um we felt it was the lord um calling us to move to Lake Elsinore um we felt that it was him that moved us to Bakersfield. Um, then back to Huntington Beach and then to Paramount. Um, we feel that it, we've always tried to be obedient and truly listen and, and seek his will for our lives, you know. And, you know, the Lake Elsinore thing, when we left, you know, we... I'll be tr- completely transparent with you. We we left um, because of some hurt that had happened uh, to one of our to one of our kids, not by anybody in Lake Elsinore. It was somebody visiting from uh, from another part of our lives. Uh, but uh, you know, we were having a home group and and growing, and uh, and I you know committed one of the worst you know fouls ever i would always encourage our, our those attending our small group don't don't run don't allow the enemy to isolate you mm-hmm. and that's exactly what happened when we left lake else or we we left in in that state just injured and and thinking that we were going to a safe place and it, it seemed to get a little worse mm-hmm. but god redeemed it mm-hmm. man he 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 did uh he did something great even out of that uh, that season. How much of what happened are you able to share? Um, well, I was. Uh, it's actually a bit linked to the uh, story that we we're talking about, the whole Jonah thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, I could get into it. Yeah. Um, one of our. Uh, kids was uh, assaulted by a young man that we were supposed to be helping uh, at our house in Lake Elsinore. Uh, like I said, it was any n- not anybody from Lake Elsinore at all. And we didn't find out about it till years later. Um, and that's when we left. Hmm. Um, so it was uh, just difficult. You know, the enemy... You know, I, I was wrestling with God on that one, you know, looking up to him saying, where were you? Um, and then him responding saying, I was right here. Mm. And then he asked me, where were you? And uh, and I gave him my response and he's been working uh, through that and really revealing himself as, as a merciful and gracious God that uh, that whose who, whose love I don't deserve, but uh, he continues to reveal himself that way to me, and it just he's amazing. He's a good God, man. So when you say uh, that his response to you was, um, "Where were you? What what 
what uh what was your response to that i was i was doing my duty i was providing for the family mm. um but i wasn't there to protect my my daughter um and so i had put my guard down um and entrusted my family uh to somebody i shouldn't have mm. and uh so those are the things that could uh, possibly happen when you're not looking. Hmm. And so um, you guys leave Lake Elsinore, and uh, does that leave uh, the the situation undealt with? What happens to this individual? What happens to um, your your child that was a victim of it? What 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 is the aftermath of it all? The aftermath was a lot of um, just misunderstood, you know, uh, you know what we would see as promiscuous. They were dealing with it as, as you know, this is normal to me now. Mm. You know, this is this is what I'm gonna do because this is what I what's happened to me. So I'm gonna let everybody, you know, take advantage of me or, or uh, allow their herself to be abused and it's like no uh, but it did it, we did attempt to you know uh see uh, the sheriffs to get involved and they couldn't do anything at that point mm. and there was actually multiple uh calls to them that uh, about this uh particular individual yeah and so uh why was it that they couldn't do anything what ha where did this individual go um they there was no evidence it would be more of a an accusation that they could we couldn't back up with evidence so uh it it uh went nowhere wow they 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 did some research and they were looking into things but uh at the end of the day they couldn't do anything wow um hmm <clears throat> so so this person is out free and you know probably not not really suffering any consequences uh as far as legally regarding that particular situation um obviously we know that the lord is an avenger and uh he makes all things right and will make all things right mm -hmm. um and and that could be some comfort to us uh but uh in, in the meantime um you know the fact that n there was no immediate consequence to him i'm sure that that's pretty devastating right absolutely um but uh this is where we ended up later in, in bakersfield uh there was some th a few things that happened there <clears throat> the parties involved um being my kids uh there was some discussion and some some contact made to that individual hmm. now this is so this is the process of you know don't i, I don't even want to make it seem like it was just a matter of minutes like hey it it's all it's all good it was a process of time but uh he uh he called me hmm. on my personal cell phone while i was at work oh wow and uh first thing he said was you're the one that invited me into your home wow right so the, i'm already i'm already tempted to load up the trunk and you know just go, just go go straight to jail because that's and uh but there was a message that the lord had for him and i had talked to his wife uh, through messenger and she wanted to know what what allegedly happened. And I was trying not to tell her. And I just said, you know, I'm going to tell her. Because she's got two daughters. Hmm. He's got two daughters. Yeah. And so the message I told gave to him from the Lord was, you need to repent. And so he started to say, well, you know, she's lying, this and that. And so 
I ended up telling him, you need to pray. You need to pray. And you tell the Lord to tell me that she's lying. Because otherwise it's on you. Mm -hmm. And it's going to stay on you. So unless you repent and handle your business with the Lord, you know where you're going to end up. You know, mm -hmm. and you're absolutely right. But the peace that God gave me was this. As I was as I was wrestling with it, he says, you know, you could you could handle that. You can handle him. You can take him out, go bury him in a hole someplace in the desert. And what's that gonna accomplish? He's make him suffer for five, ten minutes, half an hour. Or are you gonna entrust me? And and if that's what he deserves, then that's what he's gonna get, but it's gonna be eternal. But then he says, but if I want to extend mercy to this person, if I want to show him what grace is, the same grace that I've given to you, are you going to be the judge or are you going to let me do it? And I just put my head, head and hands down. I was like, okay, it's all, it's all you. So I delivered that message to that, to that person that day and told them, it's up to you. Mm -hmm. You need to repent. You need to pray. You need to get it right. And uh, haven't talked to him since. And uh, and so it's in God's hands. Yeah, it's absolutely in God's hands. Wow. What was the immediate response? That he would, that he would do so. That he would pray. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm brand that that it was. Uh, there was a change of heart. Yeah. You know, um, the the culture of the church that I think we can all observe is, um, you know, <laughs> people who haven't even experienced something like that, uh, whether to themselves or, or uh, to somebody as close as a child, um, <laughs> I think any, any uh, normal person... Uh, kind of a, a knee-jerk reaction to hearing that a person would harm a child that way is that there's a special place in hell for that mm -hmm. person. And and a lot of people do not like to believe that that there's grace and mercy for those types of individuals. Um, and and I, I do think that even though that's a very difficult thing to go through, that that it's also um, it's also the reason why those things continue to happen, right. you know, because uh, uh, the best thing isn't to just, you know, say, uh, it, it, if you do this, we're going to kill you. Yeah. We're going to have a lynch mob and we're going to just deal because that, that's not going, it's like, that's like uh, taking a weed whacker to weeds. Yeah. Doesn't really uh, affect it. It's yeah. going to spring up right. in a couple weeks. And, um, and I think a lot of people forget that that the goodness of God is what leads us to repentance, yes. and um, and that the best way is is that uh, when we share the gospel with people, that they would be co uh, not just converted but born again, yeah. and and all things are made new, and and the the sin is passed away, yeah. and so. Um, but that's once again, that's a very difficult thing to to say. Yeah. But it gives me hope that um, that you could sit here and and you can tell me that you were able to say something to this individual to that effect, <laughs> and and just uh, I guess yielding to God, saying, uh, "Who are you if I decide to extend mercy to this person?" Um, you know, if that person were to respond to the gospel at that moment and become born again mm -hmm. and repent, then he'll never hurt somebody again. Yeah. But man, I'm I'm just saying it's a it's a pretty rough thing. And so, uh, walking away from that uh, moment there, was it over? It, it's uh, that took a while to get 
to to just verify that I had heard from the Lord that I that I said what He wanted me to say, um, and I really, it, you know, He had to really renew my heart on that and and my mind as far as uh, making sure that I that you know I just wasn't here. Here's here's where the enemy got was trying to get me. And and there may be other men that may struggle or other people that may struggle with this. Because I didn't respond in violence. Mm-hmm. The enemy was trying to say, You're not a man, right? Mm-hmm. You're you you know, you, you need to handle this. And I, there's a lot of men that would handle it that way. They would go and, and literally take somebody up and 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 you know what? That 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 if that's what they needed to do then but the enemy w- was trying to convince me that I wasn't a man, and he was trying to get me to commit suicide hmm. because of that, because of the weakness that I felt because I couldn't, you know, make it right, that I couldn't uh, do anything that would, that would, you know, ease that blow to my family. And... Uh, but I knew that it was the Lord. I knew that it was the Lord. So I, that's why I, I left it in his hands. Mm. So earlier you uh, you likened the story to the story of Jonah. Mm. And uh, so I'd like to know how that how that uh, is linked to this. Okay. Um, I mentioned L.A. County when I got my DUI. <clears throat> About 20 years later, I managed to make it back in, but I didn't commit a crime. I actually, uh, I actually uh, was invited to do some jail ministry there with a brother from uh, a church in uh, Huntington Beach. So we met up and, and went in, just had a great time doing ministry. It, it was awesome, just so different than any other jail I'd been in. You could just walk around any floor that you want and uh, literally have access to any inmate that's in your path. So it's awesome, right? That's pretty cool. And you could just be just led by the Holy Spirit, just, hey, you. And I had some conversation with a guy serving food. uh, You know why that's cool, though? It's because (laughs) I've done some prison outreach, too. And sometimes when you're in there, you feel like you're in prison, too, and you forget, like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I'm I'm, I'm a free man. I didn't do no crime. I'm here helping. But but because of, you know, how the security is in these places, they they can't break those, you know, protocols. Yeah. No matter who's in there, yeah. and so so to be in a situation like that, that's that's really cool. Yeah. And and I, I imagine how effective it can effective it can be. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it was it was awesome. <laughs> so after we did the jail ministry, we were um, we went and I met the uh, senior chaplain, and so we went and had lunch, and he took me on a tour afterwards, and so it was just he and I, and uh, so we're. We're just walking around, you know, show me all the different floors, introduce me to a bunch of people. And uh, he takes me to the Hope Room, which is where they keep all, uh, a one pod where they keep all the suicides. Uh, there was probably two to 300 men there. And uh, that's a lot of brothers that want to commit suicide. Yeah. And uh, having had the experience, you know, from my I would say my mid twenties, uh, till um, to, to that most recent, I I had a lot of compassion. My heart reached, my feet were literally ready to run into that cell and and just start sharing. I had my Bible with me. I was ready to roll, you know. And then he takes me. The senior chaplain ends up taking me to the top floor which is a place they call Sodom and Gomorrah. They keep all the um, the uh, gay inmates and the um, pedophiles sex and sex offenders. Yeah. And so he says, nobody comes up here. And, you know, I'm looking around, it's just a bunch of guys, a bunch of broken dudes. I was like, okay, 
And so I left that day and, you know, my heart was reaching, it was just fixed on the hope room. I was just like, I, I got to go. I got to go and, and, and share the hope that I have in me. And uh, the next morning I, I started writing a message, my first message that I was going to share with them in the hope room. And so I'm just fixated on that. And, and you know, that still small voice says, well, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? Hmm. And I said, no, thanks. You know? <laughs> and uh, because of, of, you know, what, not, what not necessarily any specific sin there, but, you know, you're going to go and I was more afraid of, and, and, you know, going back to Jonah, he was afraid of Nineveh. He was afraid of the Assyrians of, because of how violent they were, what they were doing to his people. And so I just didn't, just didn't want to go. And I'm, I'm just arguing back and forth, you know, with, with God himself just saying, no, I don't, I don't, if you send me, I won't go. And, uh, and it, it, he he got me right, <laughs> and it really was a. Uh, what it came down to was, just go share the word, share, read the word, share the word. You know, you will not have to make any arguments with them, and share your testimony, and. And part of it was like, I was like, okay, the hope room I got. I've mm -hmm. been there, done that. Um, but then I started saying, well, I, I got no testimony for Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, what about your, your struggling with, um, you know, homosexual thoughts since you, when you were 18? What about that? Can you share that testimony to let them know they're not alone? I said, okay, I, I could do that, but what about the other guys? You know, what about the pedophiles? What about the man that you were able to share mercy and grace with? What about that? What about being the face of the people that they hurt to let them know that they are people? Mm. families that have been hurt by their by their behavior by their actions i said i could do that so you're you know this is a conversation that's happening internally but it was i said i don't need to you know argue with these guys they're not you're gonna gonna let them harm me and uh it was just a simple just go just go and uh i had been writing messages for that pod trying to get back in um but uh just waiting now for the jails to open up and see if the lord opens the door um one thing that did happen shortly after that was uh i shared that story with the brother that i went in with and he took bibles up to sodom and gomorrah hmm. so i don't know if it was for him i, I know that i want to go back uh for sure and I actually asked the senior chaplain for those two rooms specifically. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he redirected me to speak with uh, a different ministry, but to, to join, par partner up with them. But uh, I did mention it to the guy that I had gone in with, and he said that they were, it was like he, they were, he was handing out candy because mm -hmm. they were eating up those Bibles like nobody's business. Wow, so was that before or after you... Went and did your message. It was uh, after. I haven't been back since. Okay, but, but they're 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 ready to go. Wow. So so by that by your buddy going over there and handing out Bibles over there, there's you can't help to think that maybe you know from you being like one thing you just said right now that was very powerful was you know going and being the face of the person. Or the people that they hurt, and uh, I man, that that kind of 
rocked me right there. Uh, just how powerful that is. And, um, you know, it, it would seem that you going in there to share the gospel, mm -hmm. uh, which is good news for them, um, uh, why they would be open to, to receiving a Bible, you know, and, um, wow. So, so since then, uh, how has your your view of um, of ministry to to that group of people, people who struggle with that particular sort of sin, has uh, have since that moment has that caused you to have a, a compassionate spot in your heart for them? How so? Yeah, it, 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 one of my favorite. I'll, I'll just say it like this: one of my favorite messages to share with the, the brothers in, in jail is you know is getting them to understand the the fullness of God's grace how how wide and how deep his love is um, that, that how rich his mercy is right so what I do is is you know we don't go around the room we don't know what the guys that we meet with um have done we you know they're all dressed in orange and, and riverside so you know they're we don't see any of the uh super super uh crazy guys but yeah <laughs> they got tattoos on their face so it's all good but yeah. that was the first for me i was like what <laughs> but uh those those are usually the the guys that with the most uh sometimes the strongest walk you know apparently it's just amazing but anyhow we you know you start with the lie and so we will ask all right who, who's lied you know and so who's the guy that stole or robbed a bank or whatever and uh and so we just do this comparison really quick of of what we've all done you know at one point and then when we compare it to what Jesus says, you know, if you, if, if, if you say say this to your brother, if you call him stupid or something, you've committed murder. If you look at a woman and you look with lust in your heart, you committed adultery. It's like his, his, his law, his word, I mean, it's so perfect that we fall short, you know. And so we think we're living this we're living up to something when we don't do a certain sin when God's ready to forgive each and every one of them and it doesn't matter what it is that's all sin to him mm. you know when we're harming when I the way I break it down is when we're harming another one another person another one of his children we're hurting him you know, what did David say? David, David said, against you only have I sinned, right? And he, he hurt her, Bathsheba's husband. I mean, he murdered him. And had uh, and had for, uh, committed adultery with her. So it was like, you know, we, we want to sit there and think, that just because I'm I'm better than this guy, because I haven't done his particular dirt, his sin. You know we're 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 missing it. We are absolutely missing it. So I I, I have to go there with them because they have to be ready to start living that out because they are amongst you know different groups of guys that are doing different things. Yeah. And so we need them to be able to be the light and the salt in that place. You know, we can't go in there and just do that. We are training them up to be that, to to be the face of Christ in that place. Mm -hmm. And and they're getting it. Um, we had one 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 brother. Um, I, I was sharing a message. I don't even know what it was, it was about, but. Um, I forget how many guys there were in that at that in that meeting, but he just started weeping, and I said, "Hey, are you all right?" And he just said, "He just said I, I, uh, I, I don't know uh, what to do." 
And so we started talking, and I just said, all right, bro, what's going on? And he felt that God had uh, punished him for committing murder years before because, um, because his daughter had died when she was in a foster home because he had ordered a DNA test or a paternity test to find out if she was his. Now, now she was harmed by the foster dad that was in oh, that home. Man. And so he he felt that God was punishing him for the for the murder they had committed. And so I started um, just sharing, you know, Moses, David, you know, where God had had shown his mercy to to men that had committed that crime. And I said, I said he's he's not like that. He's a good father. And he just, he, you could see as he received that, you know, took him into Hebrews 11, like, man, there's really nobody perfect in here, bro. And he started to just, something was happening to his countenance. He's just like, wow. And then it took a turn. It was, it was, it was all good and it stayed all good. But he just said, he goes, yeah, we're going to start the trial for my daughter's killer next week. And I said, I said, I don't know. I don't know why we're here right now and I'm sharing this and you're receiving it. I said, but maybe it's so you can prepare your heart to possibly extend him a little mercy and grace. You know, mm -hmm. I said, I said, this is all between you and the Lord now, bro. <laughs> but <laughs> but you, it's going to be, uh, consider it, pray about it, start start reading what we were shit we were talking about and he said that he would and uh haven't seen or heard from him since but hmm. you know that was going to be uh, something that i was going to be praying about for a long time but wow. uh, yeah he left that room wow you know i i took a poll earlier on instagram mm -hmm. and and asked how many or uh have you ever had that person in your life that you just felt like you could never forgive them. And um, I think it, I put it up maybe about an hour ago. And um, and the last time I checked, it was about half an hour ago. So within half an hour, I had about eight responses. And seven out of the eight responses said, yes, they have that person that they feel they could never for, forgive. And then one person said... Um, said no. I imagine maybe because there hasn't been that experience yet, but I am absolutely certain that most people, um, if you live enough life, mm -hmm. you're going to come across somebody that is going to, um, you know, uh, <laughs> deserve deserve a, a kick in the pants, as they would say. <laughs> but but it's just. How can I forgive them, Lord? I don't know if I have the strength to do that. Mm. I don't know if I if I have the humility to be able to let this person walk away uh, from from this uh, this thing that they have done to me. Mm. Uh, one thing you said uh, as you were telling uh, your story uh, was that the enemy was attacking you and convincing you that you weren't a man because you didn't handle it like a man and. Um, and so, I I know that feeling all too well, and I've had things happen where where I've I've felt that same way where it's like I need to even if you know <laughs> you know coming from my background even if somebody gave you a a, a sideways look it was on you know. <laughs> You don't look at me like that, you know, <laughs> which is so ridiculous. Yeah. But, but that's just kind of the way that machismo that you're raised with, and or that you you find as you're uh, going through childhood. Um, but, but there's more deep things that happen to us individually that cause us to harbor hatred, to harbor unforgiveness, and um, and it just seems like I I don't I don't know that I can do that, God. 
Mm-hmm. You say that uh, forgiveness is for those who forgive. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive our debtors, yes. Jesus prayed. Yeah. And and it's like a lot of people, uh, at least uh, in the poll that I took, seven out of eight people, um, you know, can't do it. Yeah. And this, this was a, like, do you have that person in your life right now? Mm-hmm. And they say yes. Yeah. And... Um, and the thing that we have to understand about that is that um, if you can't forgive somebody, why should God forgive you? Mm. So I want to I want to invite you to to talk to that person. What would you say based on this 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 horrific thing that happened to you and your family? Coming from that perspective, what would you tell the person that maybe they have good reason mm. to 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 just be like, I'm at a standstill with this individual or person or institution um, uh, because of what they have done to me or my family. Um, and, and I just don't, I don't see forgiveness. How, how does forgiveness impact them or, or hinder them? And why is it important that they would come to a place of being able to forgive? Mm. Mm, that's a great question. I wish I had the answer, man. No. <laughs> well, I'm, I would say, you know, I, if I were to seriously look back through my life and all the horrific sin that I committed, I know that God's forgiven me much. And I could, I would, I think it would be safe to say that we could all look back and know that God's forgiven us much. And Jesus said about the woman that was washing his feet with her hair after he, she put this perfume, you know, in, on his feet. And, and he, she's just wiping his feet and with tears in her hair. The Pharisees all judgmental and saying, oh, you know, why, why you, if he knew who was touching him, Jesus knew exactly mm. who, who she was. Yeah. Right, he knows each one of us. I mean, he's seen it all go down. He's seen each and every one of the sins that have we've committed, but also the sins that have been committed against us. That's where when he when he said earlier, as I mentioned, when I said, "Where were you?" He said, "I seen it all. Hmm. I seen it all." When we've experienced forgiveness by God. Jesus told this parable that, you know, about two debtors, right? To one guy that owed millions of dollars. He was forgiven much, right? This is this great amount that he could never repay. He was he was thrown in jail. He was ready to um pay in jail for everything that he owed. But he begged his master for mercy and it was given to him. Then he gets let out and then he goes to go collect from somebody. So you think how corrupt this guy is, right? He's just been forgiven. This, you know, let's say millions of dollars. And then he goes to collect money that was owed to him, like 50 bucks or something, this ridiculously small amount compared to what he owed. And he was harsher. Oh, you know, yeah, he was harsher, and he threw him in jail and all this stuff. And then the then his master found out and threw him back in the stocks <laughs> and all this stuff. And Jesus ends that story by saying, you know, if you don't forgive, that's the way it's going to be for you. You know, and really, and I love what David David says, and I think there's a lot of different places where we see it, is that there's a lot more damage done to our hearts, done to our lives, when we carry around that unforgiveness. There's there's a lot more bondage. You know, who, who is it? Was it Ravi Zacharias that said that it that unforgiveness? Is like drinking poison and then expecting the other person to die. I forget who said yeah. it, but it was. It's, yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah, 
I've also heard that, um, I mean, I think the scriptures say it, <laughs> maybe that's where I heard it from, but, <laughs> but that, uh, unforgiveness is, is only a, a prison for yourself, Yes, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, uh, until you can, uh, forgive somebody, you will not have the keys to freedom. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, I've experienced that so true in my life, man. There's, there's been, um, there's been people that, that have hurt me, mm-hmm. very close people. And, um, and, and, you know, where there's moments where it's just kind of like, <laughs> I, I really feel like, like, um, there's no way, there's mm-hmm. no way that anything that I could ever even look that person in the face. No. And, and then, I just I have these very vivid reminders of what exactly God has forgiven me of and and because I because it's not just the sinfulness of sin. Mm. Right? That's just one side of of what's going on yeah. here. The sinfulness of sin is one thing, but the holiness of God is another thing. Amen. And so when we consider the sinfulness of sin in light of God's uh, truth, beauty, and goodness, and, and how he's holy, you know, R.C. Sproul says that in the Bible, you don't see love, love, love. You don't see truth, truth, truth. You see holy, holy, holy mm. is he. And, and the fact that we sin against him um, is, is something that should cause us to fear God. Yeah. But but thankfully, thank God that, you know, since we're in this dispensation of grace, in this time of grace, that we can, um, that we can, that fear and that trembling is a, is an honor, is a reverence to him uh, because, because we know that he bore our sin, yeah. that <laughs> like how you said, um, you know, God knows that we are knuckleheads, uh, past, present, and future. And so that's how his his mission can be complete, yeah. is that he dies once and for all. When he says it is finished, yeah. he, he's, he's saying that sin is defeated, death is defeated. And so when I look at, at, at my sin in light of his holiness, mm. that's what causes me to be like, wow. I do not deserve any ounce of forgiveness. I don't deserve any ounce of mercy or love or, or grace, but he does it anyways. Yeah. And so if he can be like in that parable you're sharing, if he can forgive my debt without me having to do anything, who am I to, to hold other people in contempt for what they owe me? Yeah. The, what they've done to me and um and so that's what's beautiful about forgiveness is that we we uh measure out that forgiveness from from a place of how we have been forgiven and um and I think that when we constantly remind ourselves of of what he has forgiven us of, we can forgive much yeah. and and not only that but not be hindered from being used by him. You know, um, I went through, I went through probably a year of, of having these unresolved, uh, issues with my sisters and, um, and I totally just kind of, you know, I, I would, I would hide, um, I would hide my, my bitterness. I would hide the fact that I was upset mm-hmm. and, uh, and kind of explain away the fact that it's like, oh, I've forgiven them, but, you know, I just keep them at a distance. But is that really forgiveness, mm-hmm. you know, or, or is that just trying to justify uh, my anger? Mm-hmm. And um, and the Lord showed me that this is this is something that is hindering you. Mm-hmm. This is something keeping you from being able to preach about forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And that's the that's one of the main anchors of the gospel, mm. the good news is the fact that that um, that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes the whole sin of of the of the world away, mm-hmm. as John said rightly, um, and and by that is through forgiveness, yeah. <laughs> and um, you know it, that wasn't something that I can say boldly until. I was able to reconcile those things with, you know, in this very specific case, my sisters, you know, and, um, and it wasn't that, uh, it was this 
crazy awful thing that they did to me it was just a it was just a disagreement and that disagreement led to a little fight and you know and then that those those words that are said in a fight which off often are not really uh sincere they're just to win the fight mm. <laughs> but they hurt people and uh and, and then it causes resentment and then bitterness and then unforgiveness yeah. and um and those are things that that we had to come to term with, terms with and fix and you know and then as soon as that happens it's just kind of like oh i've been waiting to hug you for yeah. like a year you know yeah. and and so um you know, that's one of the beautiful things about the Christian life is that because of what he has forgiven us, we're able, we are enabled to be able to extend forgiveness to other people. Amen. So anything else you'd like to add? No, I, 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 you just said bitterness and, and, you know, you can be sure that the enemy will use that, that root of bitterness, that unforgiveness in your life to, to, break things apart you know he'll use it as a foothold right to to get in there because an unforgiveness with one person becomes two mm. and it just starts to multiply yeah. so um you know be quick to re let me just encourage uh y'all here uh, and myself be quick to forgive be slow to anger you know quick to listen as well you know that always helps yeah <laughs> But uh-huh. love, love. Yeah. But we've been we've been forgiven much, so we should love much. And I, I know it's a process of time. I, you know, no way am I would I ever say, "Oh, you got to let go like right now." Just, but uh, allow the Lord to work. Seek His face, and uh, allow Him to teach you how to forgive. Amen. Amen. Well, there you have it, you guys. Uh, I want to thank Mike Jimenez for coming up the mountain and uh his uh his journey here was long and he came to he came, thanks for coming to hang out with me bro <laughs> i loved it man <laughs> and uh we're gonna continue fellowshipping as long as you guys can uh hang out mm-hmm. but um but for those of you at home um you know, I know tonight for some reason the connection was a little bit choppy, but I I've, I've been recording this, so the unchoppy version of this will be posted immediately, uh, so that uh, you can share it and uh, and enjoy the the um, the feed without any interruption. But uh, for those of you who are listening after the fact, I just want to thank you guys for taking the time to. To listen to this remarkable story, this remarkable testimony of of just true forgiveness, and and it's so awesome to see how God is working in in uh, in people's lives that way. I gotta admit that I I don't know that I could go through something that like that, and um, but it gives me hope in knowing the type of person that Mike is, um, and and the fact that he was able to overcome that because of God speaking to him and reminding him of his love that he was able to he was able to extend the mercy of God in that way that's so powerful to me and um and is a honestly I got to admit that um when I was first told this story by Mike I was going through a major probably the the worst um the worst situation I had ever experienced with a with a good friend of mine, and uh, and it was because of the story that I was able to truly forgive this person, um, you know, because it couldn't even compare. The scenario could not even compare, and and so my prayer is that. As you are listening to this, or you're thinking about it, or if you know somebody. Um, Make sure you share this video and make sure you comment about it and and t- have God ask God to take inventory of your heart to see if there be any unforgiveness and and bitterness in there. Maybe that's the thing that is holding us back from being able to truly serve him. You know, um, I cannot stress it enough that that we're in some strange times right now. And and you have to know that the the tides are changing and and god is is unraveling his plan and um i'm not a date setter or anything like that but he's his return is drawing near it's it's nothing else needs to happen in order for him to come back and um and there's no time there's no time and there's no room to be 
lugging around that bitterness, that unforgiveness, harboring hatred. There's, there's no room for it. Mm-hmm. Unpack those bags. Seek those people out. Reconcile that, that uh, relationship that's been severed. Go and build that bridge. Go and, and, um, and let there be forgiveness and reconciliation. The Bible says that we are called to the ministry of reconciliation uh, in, uh, um, in, in co-laboring with Christ in that matter. And so I want to encourage you guys to, to not sleep on those issues that you have. Do not let another night go by without calling that person and saying, I love you, forgive me. Um, and, and I want to move forward. All right. And uh, that'll do it for this episode of Run and Tell. Next week's episode, we will have uh, a little lighter note and uh, we'll have a good friend of mine, Daniel Marfil, who's a big jokester, a big huggable bear. And uh, and uh, he makes me we we laugh all the time to the point where my head and my face and my stomach hurts. And and so uh, we're going to have a good time next week. And and, uh, you know, just. Uh, fellowshipping and and hearing about the good things that God has done in each other's lives throughout the years. So uh, God bless you guys. And thanks for bearing with us through this choppy connection. God bless.